Welcome back. We'll start with one of the most awaited class that is the Gauchi Leong chapter 1st Earth and Universe. Now Gauchi Leong is a very important book for covering geography for general studies for both prelims and mains perspective. Now the first topic that we would be covering is a very very conceptual topic. So uh, we would be trying to focus more on the concepts in this lecture. Now the first thing that we try to understand is the concept of galaxy. Galaxy we can say is a group of stars or a cluster of stars. The galaxy in which we live is known as Milky Way. Now what I am trying to demonstrate here is a kind of uh, planet or I would say not a planet, a star that I have here and it is very close to you. So what you can see here is this star appears to be bigger. What would happen if I move this star away from you? That means this star appears to be smaller and the distance is increasing. That means the star which are closer to us take less time to transmit their lights to the earth. So let's say the light from the nearest star would reach earth in 4 years. The next further, the next star would take nearly 8 years and so on and so forth. Sun is closer than that so you would have 8 minutes and moon is further further close so you would have nearly instantaneous light that you would get. So distance governs the light that you receive. The, so that is one of the basic phenomena that we understand. The next is the concept of solar system. Now solar system, let's say sun, we are depicting sun to be small because it is uh, away from us and then you have the first planet that is Mercury. Now this sun has an interior temperature of nearly 20 million degrees Celsius and the outside temperature which is nearly 6000 degrees Celsius but in reality it is nearly 3 lakh times the size of the earth and we have a very small planet that is Mercury which orbits around the sun. Now this Mercury being very close to it nearly 36 million miles completes the, com uh, the revolution in 88 days. On the other hand, you have the farthest one which is now considered as a planetoid that is Pluto takes nearly 247 years to complete this one revolution. So this is again governed by the distance. The closer planets complete their revolution much faster as compared to far away planets. The next to Mercury is Venus which is considered as the Earth's twin or we also call it, uh, call it as a twin planet of Earth. Then you have the earth itself, earth has a natural satellite of its own which is moon and moon takes 27 days to complete one revolution around the earth. Next to earth you have Mars which has dark patches and now we are exploring the possibility of life on Mars. Now the two very important ones are Jupiter and Saturn, Jupiter is the largest planet, it Gases are mainly hydrogen, helium and methane. It has the highest number of satellites that is 12 satellites with dark and light bands and it is very cold. Saturn comes next to Jupiter, it is second largest and comes second in terms of satellites also. So it has 9 satellites and it takes nearly 29.5 years to complete the revolution. Now moving from the Saturn to Pluto. You have the distance that increases dramatically from 29.5 years to 247 years. That means the distance between Saturn and Pluto itself becomes much larger. Uranus is the next one which is bluish green 50 times larger than Earth and 15 times heavier than Earth. And it's the most unique thing is it orbits east to west and all other planets move west to east. So that's very very important for Uranus. Then you have Neptune that has two satellites and is colder and we already talked about Pluto which is now considered as a planetoid. Now the most important thing that we would be understanding today is the shape of the earth. So what we are doing here is I have a sphere here and I am compressing the sphere from the two edges. So what is happening here is the shape is being get, uh, the shape is getting deformed and this is the shape which is known as geoid or oblate spheroid. So you have flatter poles and spherical equatorial region. So as you can see here you have the equatorial diameter 
that is nearly 7926 miles and the polar diameter is lesser than the equatorial diameter by 26 miles and when it comes to circumference again the polar circumference is less by 83 miles so that's very very important to understand now we will come on to the very important section of this class that is why or how we can prove earth is a sphere that's very very important to understand now let's take the earth here and what i'm doing is i'm placing this earth on the board what i'm trying to help you understand here is you need to visualize this three dimensional object as a two dimensional object here so here i draw this earth which is originally this now what is happening is this is consider this to be a ship and you have the ship which is seen here now the person standing on the top here what would on the surface of the ocean coast here what he would see at a distance uh, at a distance he would see only the mast of the ship however as the ship comes closer he would be able to visualize the complete ship that means the earth is spherical had the earth been straight what would happen you would see the same ship always with the same mast and the same hull there would be no changes here because this in the spherical shape is there you would see first the mast and then you would see the complete ship so that proves the spherical shape of the earth so that's one thing the next is the sunrise and the sunset if there was no spherical uh, shape you would have complete sunlight and complete sunset on whole of the earth there would be no zones of darkness and brightness in either case so that should be ruled out so you have sunrise and sunset as another evidence when there is a lunar eclipse what happen you see a spherical or a ellipse shape or a shadow that means that shape is not coming from a square planet that could be possible so we say the earth's shape is again spherical the next is circular horizon it's again a very interesting concept let's say the earth was flat i am at a point a i can visualize this distance and i can see things bigger if i move far away to point b i would have the same area that would be covered again the only difference would be i would see the things little smaller what would happen if there is the curved surface of the earth if there is a curved surface of the earth and i am at a point a i would be able to see this region if i move further beyond to point b what would happen i would be able to see a much larger area as compared to point a so my horizon would increase or the area that i can witness would increase and that shows or supports the evidence of sphericity the most important is circumnavigation so most of the sailors during that time said that if the earth was straight we are sailing through and there is no point where we can see a abrupt fall or a abrupt drop so if the earth was straight what would happen if a ship is sailing it would finally drop off somewhere but that in reality does not happen that means there is circumnavigation that is possible you can move around and come back so you have uh, that's again evidence of sphericity then since all the other planetary bodies which we have now uh, we are now explored are spherical earth cannot be a corollary to it so it has to be spherical driving poles on the level grounds again is a very important ph phenomena i have three poles which are here on a flat surface and then i have a curved surface and i have three poles this is my line of sight when this is my line of sight i can see only one pole however if i have this line of sight i can see all the three poles but on a flat surface i would have the visibility for all the three poles always that means there is an element of curvature on the earth surface and that needs to be corrected and that correction is nearly 8 inch per mile the last is with the help of aerial photos we can understand the sphericity of the earth the next important topic is the movements on the of the earth 
those are the rotation and the revolution. Now to simplify this again, we will take the same ball to help you understand. So you have this ball and what I am doing is I am moving this ball on its own axis and when you are moving on its own axis west to east you call this as rotation. This rotation takes 24 hours to complete and that is on its own orbit. The next is movement of the planetary body along uh, around a center body. So let us say this is sun and this is earth and earth is moving around sun. So that is what is revolution. Revolution causes seasons and rotation causes day and night because since you are rotating if that portion is witnessing day this portion would witness night. So this is sun and this is rotating on its own axis. What would happen if it is day here and night here I rotate it and it becomes day here and night here because the sunlight is reaching only this section. Now the next important thing is the inclination of the earth. The inclination of the earth is 66 and a half degrees. Now this is very very interesting to understand. I have sun here and I have the inclination of the earth here. You can see the slope this region where I, my thumb is not there would be the region of day or light and this region where I have my thumb pointing would be the region of darkness. Now what would happen observe this carefully. Now the region where I have the thumb is the region of darkness. When I am orbiting around the sun what is happening? This region comes close to the sun. So the region which has the, uh, the region with the thumb now it is witnessing light or day and when I move further and come at this position the region with the thumb becomes the region of darkness and you have light on this side. So what is happening when you are orbiting? When you are orbiting you are witnessing changes in the seasons. So that is where you call it as 21st June and 22nd December the summer solstice and the winter solstice. Now again we are talking right now about the north hemisphere. So what happens towards the north hemisphere? You have the equator and the 90 degrees. So as you move northward, listen carefully, as you move northward what would happen? The daylight would increase because of the inclination. So you would have nearly 6 months of light on the poles or I can say 24 hours of daylight. Since it would be 24 hours of daylight at arctic circle, it, this arctic circle is also known as the land of midnight sun because even during the midnight you are witnessing light or sunlight. So you call this region as the land of midnight sun and this, the inverse happens in the south hemisphere. However, you have the month of March that is 21st March and 23rd September where you have the equinoxes. Equi means equal so the, uh, to understand it better you have equinox that is equal day and equal night that could be seen in this region. So you have summer solstice, the days are longer, nights are shorter, winter solstice, shorter days, longer nights. In simple terms what I am trying to summarize here is, so all these are governed by the revolution. Again, one revolution is completed in 365 days and uh, 365 and one fourth day. What is important to understand here is if I add one fourth four times it becomes one. So what would I do? I am doing this four times. So after four years I would add one day. So in routine we say we have 365 days but every fourth year we add a day. So it becomes 366 days and we call this as leap year. Now this additional day of the leap year is added to the month of February which increases from 28 days to 29 days every fourth year. So that is again an important concept to understand here. Now the mathematical calculation for understanding a location. So let us understand a location on a two dimensional platform first. So I have a two dimensional platform here. What I do is I draw a circle, I mark a point. Now how do I locate 
or say the exact location of the point. If I want to say the approximate location, I'll say go east from the post office in front of the garden, back of the yard and so on and so forth. But those would be the approximate location. When I want to calculate the mathematical location, it should be exact. So when I say exact, that means it would be intersection of two points. So this intersection of two points would give me the exact location. Now let's look onto the earth. You have a point marked here. You have the parallel that is running, running here. The horizontal parallels that are uh, run are known as latitudes and they form an angular distance in degree from the center of the earth. The, the whole center of the earth, they would have the latitude that you would see. Now what would happen? If I draw a longitude here, a vertical line from here, I can give the exact location for this point and that would help me understand the precise location. So when I draw a line here, what I am doing is I am drawing a vertical line and that line is known as longitude. Longitudes are also known as meridians and they are angular distance from the equator. Now the very important concept as you can see in this ball again that would be easier to understand. So you have the longitudes that are running here. Now you see the distance between the purple area here it is much wider. Let me twist it a little. It's not exactly what we try to depict on the earth, but it's an approximation. So the distance between the two lines is decreasing here. So on a spherical surface, if I draw ver vertical lines, what would happen? Those lines would be broader towards the center and finally they would converge towards the poles. So the circumference of the earth at equator, let's say is 25,000 miles and you have 360 degrees in all, what would happen? You would have 25,000 divided by 360 that would come up to 69.1 mile. So the distance between the latitude, sorry longitude at equator would be 69.1 mile. If I move nearly 25 degrees north or south whatever, I have the distance as 62.7 miles. If I move at 45 degrees, this distance changes to 49 miles and finally at 90 degrees, it would be 0 miles. That means all the lines are converging at that point. So that is how latitudes run. So that's again a very important concept to understand. Now we would be talking about the latitude and the time. Remember, we have covered the calculation of time zones in our NCRT class 6 chapter 2 video which has a link here. You can go there for the exact time calculations. We won't go into the detail of time calculation. Here what we would be focusing is the conceptual understanding for this portion. Now 0 degrees is the prime meridian. This prime meridian is being given by the Royal Observatory uh, Greenwich and that is considered as 0 degree. So from the 0 degree you move you have east and the west. So let's say this is 0 degree. So India would be at around 102 degrees east. You say let's it's Chennai. 0 degrees is London. And nearly 70 degrees west you have New York. Okay. What I'm trying to explain here is a very simple phenomena right now. But later on I will try to bring the paradox in. So right now let's understand this. In London if it is 12 noon it would be approximately what I am doing is approximation. Approximately it would be 7 pm here and 7 am here. That means a person when in London is having lunch. The person in Chennai would have his dinner and the person in New York would have his breakfast. So that's a very simple way of understanding this. Again, when we say prime meridian, we talk about time zones. When we say international date line, we talk about changes in the day. So it's changes in the time and changes in the day. So we'll understand this later in the next slide. For now, the Chennai is towards the east. So what I'm doing, I can say in simple terms, when I'm moving east, I'm gaining. I'm gaining from 12 noon to 7 pm. So 
you are adding so i am adding plus 7 so 12 plus 7 would become 7 pm here so eza is one of the abbreviations that you can learn here east gain and add so as you move east you gain and you add as you move west you lose and you subtract so that's the very simple understanding of the concept here but it is not over here what's the most important thing and the most interesting thing is what comes now when you move west you get bonus time that means the person when at 7 am is having breakfast here he still has four hours and still has time for another breakfast so what is being trying to explain here is when you are trying to move towards west you are getting bonus time you have four hours extra to work however when you are already towards the east you have already vanished off your seven hours you don't have any more hours so in that you are losing time now don't confuse it with the abbreviation that we learned here the ega and the wls the ega says east gain and add and now you would say you are saying losing so here what we were trying to explain is when you are moving east you are gaining in terms of the exact time so it's from 12 noon it becomes 7 pm but in reality you have lost those seven hours okay so that is the very very important crux of understanding the changes with the time zone the similar concept is very important to understand the concept of IDL or the international date line. Now international date line runs at 180 degrees. It has few bends at Bering Street, Fiji and Tongo and those bends are meant to cover the complete nation into one time zone. So you have the date line that goes in this fashion and that tries to accumulate or concentrate the whole nation at one one corner into one time zone otherwise it if it would have been a straight line it would cut that nation and the same nation would have two time zones so to avoid that kind of duplication you have the bends in the international date line that is seen the first thing uh, now before we do more on uh, date line another two important things time zones when we were talking about uh, the highest number of time zones are in ussr so it has 11 time zones from Leningrad to Vladivostok. you have changes with 11 time zones each time zone of uh, different duration so when you are moving from Leningrad to Vladivostok, you have to set your watch a number of times to reach the exact location exact time to match the exact time at Vladivostok. now why this international date line was discovered when Magellan was moving around the earth he sailed and reached back his home country in Spain. He, reala he realized that there was a day off. And to adjust that day off in the early 1800s, uh, it was nearly 1500s when Magellan went to explore the world. And in 1800s, there, around 1800s, there was the concept of international date line that came up. Now, I have zero degrees, that's the Greenwich Meridian that's here. What I am trying to do is, I am moving towards let us say India here and India is towards the east of Greenwich Meridian and this portion is known as Eastern Hemisphere and the portion beyond this would be known as Western Hemisphere, that is one thing. Now this Eastern Hemisphere in technical terms when we are drawing it on the map you are drawing this eastern hemisphere towards the western side so that is the most important point where most of the students get confused so you have the eastern hemisphere on the western side and that is the major paradox of this international date line concept so eastern hemisphere is on the west side of the international date line and western hemisphere is on the eastern side of the international date line now let's say the western side or the eastern hemisphere is the Asiatic region and this is the American or the Hawaii region that we are talking about. So when it is midnight Thursday on America in American side it would be midnight Friday on the Asiatic side. That means when you are crossing the international date line into the eastern hemisphere a date is increasing 
so date is increasing from thursday to friday but in reality what has happened you have lost one day there is no more thursday you have directly switched on to friday so what is happening here is you are technically losing a day so we can say moving westward or moving towards eastern hemisphere you lose a day it's very important not moving towards east what i'm saying is moving towards eastern hemisphere or moving towards west you lose a day however you have the vice versa that exists here so moving eastward or moving towards western hemisphere you gain a day so what is happening here in reality shifting from asia side to america side what would happen you would have you would move back from friday to back to thursday so you would have one more friday that you would be witnessing you already witnessed a friday in asia you asia side you would again witness a friday in the america side so what would happen is you would gain a day here when you are moving towards western hemisphere or the eastern side so that's the key aspect to understand the international date line we have done a lots of numericals on international date line time zone calculation in our uh, the ncert lecture the link of which we have already mentioned so this was the basic concept of the crux of the first chapter of gauchi leon there are 25 chapters to go we wish to cover uh, we wish to complete those before the upcoming mains examination this year if you have any doubts or comments you are free to leave those as comment below the video have a good day ahead